I'm Richard Guerin with EE Times. We're here at the Design Automation Conference Tuesday. Uh, we've just had a very interesting panel on uh, EDA Megatrends looking at the year 2017. We're talking with Art DeGius, uh, Chairman and CEO of Synopsys, and one of our panelists. And uh, Art, you had uh, some forecasts about the EDA in the year 2017. Could you just briefly uh, reiterate what your forecast was? Sure, we were forced to do forecasts, and right. so we were rather precise. For EDA, it's going to be 8.544 billion by late July of 2017. Late, late July, that's an important part of it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we want to be precise, right? So that's a pretty good growth rate. What's that based on? Right. Uh, it's actually really based on the semiconductor industry, right? You can see it growing between 7 and 9% uh, today, and EDA has been following it literally for a couple of, uh, of decades. And there's no question that the number of problems we have to solve is growing rapidly, so we should be well employed. Now, you presented something called a techonomics model. Why is that an important thing to consider when looking at the future? Oh, I think it's important because I think the nature of the entire industry is changing radically. You know, for 30 years, it's all been just more technology, more technology, and actually it's called Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. At the same time, right now, the economics are playing in. And I sort of like this, this four-quadrant model where you have, you know, scale complexity and systemic complexity in the verticals and horizontal you have technology and economics and I think the economics layer is putting more and more pressure on how to do the technology. What's an example of that, of how economics are becoming more important? Well, uh, let's take uh, the, ex uh, the example of scale complexity economically as it applies to capacity. To be in the fab game you need to shell out at least two and a half to three billion to play a 300 millimeter fab. And what we're seeing right now is that the entire industry is sort of reconfiguring itself around groupings that essentially share this cost. That's a good example of uh, scale economics. Okay. Another question. There's been some talk here at this panel and elsewhere at this conference about the increasing importance of, of software development, the cost of software development, particularly in relationship to uh, multi-core where you get into concurrent programming and so forth. What role can EDA play or should EDA play in helping with this problem? Oh, I think we should be all over it. Uh, first, why is it now? Why wasn't it before? Well, because essentially every chip right now is a complete computer, mm. actually much more complex than a, a computer. You know, a cellular phone is probably one of the most complex computer systems there is, mm -hmm. and the amount of embedded software in there is enormous. And so if you could model how this hardware will work before you have it, it's mm -hmm. possible to start the, the software development, which is clearly an increasing portion of the overall cost. But do you see EDA vendors such as yourself becoming providers of embedded software development tools? Not becoming, we are. We are already, we have already invested in this uh, substantially. And uh, even today, for, take an example of, uh, of the OMAP platform T from TI, which is probably the most distributed uh, cellular phone platform. Well, today we have a software model of that that makes it possible to simulate the hardware without using the hardware, run at about uh, 50 megacycles, and therefore develop software long before the hardware is available. And that's the idea of virtual prototyping. That it's called virtual prototyping, exactly. Right, right. But, but I don't see you getting into compilers, debuggers, real-time operating systems, and, and so forth. Is that right? Because there are a number of players that do this very well. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, tongue-in-cheek, if you look at uh, C compilers and C debuggers, they are incredibly good and incredibly free today. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's not a good business to enter. That's right. There is also discussion at this panel here about programmable platforms. I'm wondering if you see that as a viable direction forward for chip design. I think that is a, the word platform I really mm -hmm. like for mm -hmm. a very simple reason, which is to say, can you bring a set of functionality together and then create many derivatives much mm -hmm. cheaper? And by the way, it applies to uh, the, the chip design, of course, mm -hmm. and more and more the ones that have platforms that are rich in IP and well-structured will do much better than the others, but it applies to our field as well. We made a transition at Synopsys in the last four or five years to go to a few platforms, an implementation platform, a verification platform, now a DFM platform, and it is all about the efficiency of an overall uh, design flow. Okay. Now, taking a step back, if we could, to the year 2007, what do you think is, is, is really hot at DAC this year? Uh, I think there are two topics that stand out, and they, they're topics that have been long in coming. One is power. Mm -hmm. Power is absolutely the bottleneck in everything in design. It is now the, the, one of the reasons that people have gone to multi-core, by the way, which has now all kinds of other uh, applications. Mm -hmm. But power ties together everything. And the good news is, uh, with the UPF standard and many people behind it, and an enormous amount of really good solutions, I think this one is moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I think the other problem, or, or the other challenge, and therefore the other set 
of investments is all around verification. Mm -hmm. Verification is growing much more rapidly than Moore's Law because the state space is expanding much more rapidly. And of course, you mentioned already the hardware software verification, which right. is a specific case. But just the raw RTL verification is an enormous task. We're talking about s some people using tens of thousands of computers nonstop doing verification. Well, there's a lot we can do there. Mm. Well, one more thing, I'm, I'm noticing that we're, we're not seeing new DFM startups anymore, we're not seeing a lot of DFM announcements. Does something run its course? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, as in all uh, new fields, there's a phase where you have all kinds of independent ideas, do this, uh, deal with that problem, and so on. But over time, these things are systemically connected, meaning you cannot uh, solve stress analysis if you don't simultaneously have an understanding of three-dimensional mm -hmm. simulation. And so critical mass is needed around an area, and a number of people have invested in that. We are certainly uh, probably the, the heaviest investment. We're by far the largest in DFM. Mm -hmm. And I still believe that we have a long way to connect it all up mm -hmm. so that ideally we can predict yield during the design. Mm -hmm. And it took us you know, 10 years to be really, right. really proficient on predicting timing. And now we will start to predict uh, yield. And for that, we need to interact very much with the semiconductor vendors. Right. Okay, well, thank you, Art, for your perspective. Thank you. And thank you for watching the E-Times TV.